It's not easy to find your own words. But if you find your own words, and they're truthful words, there isn't anything that can stop them. You think, well, do you believe that? Well, let's go back to the sovereign idea. Are you sovereign citizens or not? Well, if you are, well, why is that? Well, it's because you have a certain faculty, a certain power. Well, what do you have? You have the power of your convictions and your truth and your ability to communicate. And that's what's supposed to set the state straight. Okay, so you have that. It's like, well, then maybe it's truth that you're pursuing and seeking if you have any sense. And what truth? Well, truth is the best reflection you can manage of reality. Imperfect, because you're imperfect, but it's the best you've got. It's like, what, what's going to be better for you than to have reality on your side? And what's going to stand in your way if you have reality on your side? Lies? I don't think so. That isn't how it works. And I don't think anyone believes that, because the other thing I've noted and discussed with people frequently is, if you have someone that you love, a child, let's say, and you're trying to raise a child in a decent manner, you don't tell them, look, kid, this is how the world runs. Everything's corrupt beyond belief, including you and your parents and, and society and, and nature, for that matter. It's just, it's just complete bloody hell everywhere. And the only possible way that you can make it through life effectively is to learn to lie as brilliantly and uh, undisguisably as possible. No one does that. Well, why not? If you believed in falsehood, if you believed that that was the way forward, then that would be the right thing to teach. But you don't. You teach your children to tell the truth, even if it's painful. And the reason for that is that you actually believe in the power of the truth. I'll finish that with one thing. There's, there's a very interesting scene in Revelations. There's a very strange document appended to the end of the primary book in the Western canon, right? And it's a hallucinogenic nightmare, um, Revelation. And in it, Christ comes back to earth. And he's not the merciful savior of the gospels. He's the judge. And there's a reason for that, a psychological reason. And the reason is, is that if you have an ideal, and whatever Christ is, metaphysically or psychologically, he's an ideal. If you have an ideal, an ideal is a judge. Because the ideal judges you, right? Okay, so he comes back as a judge. He has a sword in his mouth, and he judges the saved and the, and the damned, and it's not pretty. But here's something interesting, it's so fascinating. He saves his worst contempt, and, and uses contemptuous language. He says, I will spit you out of my mouth, it really means I will vomit you out of my mouth. Not if you were a bad person, not if you were a good person, not if you were a bad person, but if you sat on the bloody fence. Right? If you were neither warm nor cold, you wanted to play it both ways. Well, I'll lie when it's in my favor, and I'll tell the truth when it's expedient for me. It's like, you're, you're in the category of the damned. And I think that's absolutely right, because that's real cowardice. If you believed in falsehood, it's like, good, get on with it, man. You can be a criminal and lay your life out and see how that works. And if you believe in truth, well, then perhaps you put yourself on the line for the truth. But you don't play the the two sides against the middle, because there's, there's nothing in that that isn't self-serving at the cost of your own well-being and at the cost of everyone else's. So you have to think about, you have to think about your relationship with the truth. You know, there isn't anything more important that you can do than that. And because you're, you're un, you're, I've seen people in major corporations that were corrupt and failing, spend three years doing nothing but telling the truth, often at their own peril, fix the companies. And it's such a relief to the people that they were talking to, because they'd go talk to them, the companies run by people who are not doing what they should be doing. And they're questioning, it's like, okay, well, what's really going on here? Well, no one wants to talk because they're afraid, but the person who's doing the questioning actually wants to know, and people start opening up, and he gathers information. It's like, oh, I see, here's the real problems here. It's like, we've got all sorts of problems here. This is why the company's in trouble. But it's okay. If we know the problems, well, then we can fix them, and we'll go ahead and fix them, and then the company will work. And everybody who's terrified and won't say anything and isn't really working hard anymore because they're so dispirited and believing that the projects are corrupt and that the leadership isn't doing what it's supposed to, they start having a bit of hope. It's like, really? You mean, 
you're actually willing to admit that that is the problem and you're going to give me a problem that is a real problem that I could actually work on and actually solve and benefit from that? And the whole company switches around. And, and it, that works. It's not naive to believe that. And I'll say one more thing about trust that's very much worth knowing. So this is what you learn if you're a clinician. Most people who trust are naive. And naive is not a virtue. It's a fault. It's partly a fault because if you're naive and you run into someone who's malevolent, including you, they might do you incalculable damage so that you will never recover. So that's not a good thing. You don't want to be naive. If you're not naive, that means you've been burned once or twice or three or four times. And you know, once you've been burned in that manner, well, then it's hard to trust because you think, well, why would I trust you or me for that matter, knowing full well that I can be betrayed? And so then you're cynical. And you think, that's an improvement over being naive. You know, it's, you're more mature, cynical, than you are naive, even if it's premature. And it's often premature in young people. It's like, okay, so how do you get out of that conundrum? Well, this is a crucial thing to know. You trust people because you're courageous. That's why. It's the same reason that you're grateful. It's a mark of courage. It's a mark of commitment. It's like, you and I, we're going to make an agreement. And you're full of snakes, and so am I. And there's lots of ways this can go sideways. But we're going to put together an agreement. We're going to articulate it out. We're going to try to find something that is of mutual benefit to both of us. We're going to put our hands out and shake, and we're going to try to stick to that. And we're going to risk trusting each other. Right? It's a risk. And that's the risk upon which the state is based, really. Like, I, I believe, and I think the evidence for this is very strong, by the way, I don't think that there is any other natural resource than trust. And for trust, you need courage, not naivety. And you've got to overcome your cynicism so that you trust. And then you ask yourself, too, if you don't trust your institutions, it's like, hey, they're your institutions. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go out and do something about them? You think, well, I can't. It's like, that's not true. That is, that is absolutely not true. That, that's, there's, there's nothing vaguely accurate about that in a society like this. Almost all of our democratic institutions are crying out for people to participate. They can't find enough people to do it. And if you participate and you, and, and you do it diligently and you have your say and you're careful and trustworthy and, and, you, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you speak your mind, you can have way more effect than you think. So, if you're cynical about the institutions, it's like, look in the mirror. Because those institutions, the corruption of those institutions is a direct reflection of your inability to get your act together. And that's what it means to be a sovereign part of the Western community. So it's not someone else.